so we'll um yeah very good to see you, those of you just arrived uh too um and we're continuing in our theme um <clears throat> exploring the path of regular and irregular steps um <clears throat> uh however <laughs> um uh in terms of the regular sequence of uh themes, uh, what should be happening tonight is Amrit Chandra should be talking on the path of regular steps, uh, seeing as Kula Priya talked on the path of irregular steps, but she's ill, uh, so we're not going to be able to do that. We're going to have to jump forward uh, and uh, not follow the regular sequence at all. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, follow with uh, the start of the threefold path, so that's what we'll start to... Um, <clears throat> yeah, what I wanted to do is um, throw out a question um to you um on this uh, this theme so as i said we're going to be exploring the threefold path um probably familiar to most people the path of ethics meditation and wisdom very it's the sort of central formulation really um <clears throat> of the buddha's teaching okay so yes we're exploring uh this central formulation of ethics meditation and wisdom the whole path um, in one small, neat formulation, <clears throat> and particularly this week focusing on ethics. So this is within the context of exploring this notion of, of the importance of regular steps, uh, i.e. kind of doing step one before you do step two, rather than just doing the step that you quite like, <laughs> you're quite attracted to. That's the the the, the sort of the central uh, kind of theme we're exploring. Um, so this path of ethics, meditation, and wisdom is a sequence, a sequence of three stages. Um, <clears throat> and um, ethics, um, one of the key things about ethics in Buddhism is that it's an ethics of intention. Uh, this is one of the central sort of... Um, tenets, if you like, of ethics in Buddhism, uh, that it's, it's, that's what is ethical or unethical is defined, determined by the intention. So this goes right back to um, uh, the beginning of the Dharmapada, one of the, the uh, best known, much loved uh, Buddhist texts, uh, the Dharmapada. Um, where the first two verses um, go like this. Experiences are preceded by mind, led by mind, and produced by mind. Speak or act with an impure mind, and suffering follows as the cartwheel follows the hoof, hoof of the ox drawing the cart. Experiences are preceded by, by mind, led by mind, produced by mind. Speak or act with a pure mind, and happiness follows like a shadow that never departs. So there we are. Our experience somehow unfolds, uh, determined by the intention, the quality of the intention. If, if the intention is pure, uh, then coupled to that uh, action, or if it's impure, coupled to that action, just like kind of dragging a cart, you can't get away from the bullet, can't get away from it, uh, suffering uh, ensues. That's what's being said. Um, conversely, with pure intention, um, a shadow that we just can't get away from uh, follows, follows us around. Um, a friend actually pointed out that shadow, probably for, in India, was a, a much more positive uh, <laughs> um, kind of image, you know, shade, uh, being what you desperately <laughs> seek <laughs> uh, in India, in, in the Indian mm. sun. Anyway, there we are. So what I wanted to throw out to you to start off with is um, uh, this, uh, is that true? Does happiness arise from pure intentions? What's your experience? Yeah, does happiness arise from pure intentions? acting on pure intentions so if you just like to we can do this quite kind of chaotically uh if you just like to sort of turn uh to find three or four people uh just for just for sort of uh five six seven minutes something like that 
uh, we just start to explore that in our own experience. Yeah. Right, so so any discoveries? <laughs> Is it true? We're not there yet. We're not there yet, right. We're not there to make the good intention yet. Oh, right, well, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah thanks. We need more time to discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the good example of we had good intentions, but two people didn't get to speak and they might be rude. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, they might be good. Well, they might be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Great. Any more discoveries? Any more to pitch in? Um, we, we, I think we sort of spent a little bit of time sort of um, uh, uh, acknowledging the fact actually that trying to establish whether our intentions are good or not is actually quite tricky. Yeah, yeah. Um, is, that's, yeah. That's, that's, uh, we spent quite a bit of time th thinking how we mm. might we might do that. <clears throat> very, very good. I'll cross that point off my um, <laughs> no need to. Yeah, well, you definitely need to. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, um, well, I suppose one one question, uh, you know, I mean, you can you can act ethically, and and uh, actually, it's quite uncomfortable. It's quite an uncomfortable thing to do. You can act, you know, with with the the, the, the purity, any all the purity you can muster, uh, at least. And um, actually, it kind of uh, it gives you more trouble. Uh, you you know, the, the the person kind of didn't like you. Uh, saying what you said, you know, and uh, your boss thinks you shouldn't have said it, or whatever it is, you know, it can actually kind of bring you into difficulty as well. Um, I don't know if you ever had that experience. Um, yeah, so it doesn't seem, in that instance, it doesn't seem like a, a straightforward, necessarily mm -hmm. uh, a straightforward uh, relationship. Uh, but I guess one way into this is to look at the threefold path, is to look at the threefold path. So what's being said is if we act, um, on the basis of pure intention, um, <clears throat> you know, as uh, as has already been said, our, our intentions are often quite dilute, aren't they? They're sort of there's a bit of sort of fear of what other people will think about me, uh, <clears throat> or kind of wanting something back, kind of diluted in. <laughs> it's it's rare that our intentions are sort of pure, and that's I quite like that that uh, sense of purity, that sense of being undiluted, uh, that we uh, we intend to do something, we fully intend uh, to, you know, our, our intention is sort of coherent, if you like, uh, undiluted, pure, and we act on the basis of that. It's kind of rarely like that, isn't it? It's more often sort of rather mixed. You don't quite know what the mix is, uh, but you hope and you think there's something good in there. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, that perhaps that's one way into this word purity. Um, of course, the Buddhist tradition, um, the word is getting at um, what's the, the, what's usually translated as skillful, uh, skillful intention, intentions that are based on love, uh, generosity, and awareness, as opposed to greed, hatred, and delusion. That's what's being got at. Um, but yeah, often it's it's uh, our Skillful intentions, our pure intentions, are a bit sort of diluted with uh, unskillful, uh, with a bit of kind of wanting something back, a bit of greed, um, or wanting to sort of solve some sort of problem. Anyway, when we do manage to um, act on our purer sort of intentions, um, uh, it's wonderful, isn't it? And what we can notice is that we start to sort of come together. As a person, we start to sort of uh, feel ourselves kind of coming together. Um, and this is what the next stage of meditation kind of emerges out of. That the next stage is really getting at the fact that um, if we do act ethically, um, we can actually access um, radically altered uh, states of consciousness. Um, <clears throat> Uh, traditionally called the, the dhyanas, uh, that it's possible uh, to actually sort of access kind of super conscious states uh, of uh, experience, um, but only on the basis of um, that, you know, when we sort of really come together, um, we're not sort of diluted, dis dispersed. Um, <clears throat> 
you know, when I act afterwards, there's a kind of, um, you know, I can be worrying about what, you know, what do they think about that? Or um, <clears throat> uh, how has that sort of impacted on um, on my reputation or something like that? Um, <clears throat> in that way, I'm sort of scattered. Um, it's almost the same image as being diluted, isn't it? But do, do, do you see what I mean? Whereas actually when we act on pure intentions, uh, you don't have to think about how that went and what people thought about it. So lovely experience that, isn't it? Uh, but it's that kind of coming together um, integration um, that allows us to actually access these deeper or higher states of consciousness. So that's really what, what the point is with this next step of Samadhi. We can't access those merely through learning better technique, better meditation technique. Uh, that's what's being said, that we need to take the first step of ethics, um, you know, quite rigorously engage with ethics in our life. Uh, and out of that, the next step will naturally emerge. This is what Amra Chandra is going to talk about a bit more next week, uh, this sort of natural uh, arising of step two uh, on the basis of step one. And then, uh, so that's samadhi, that's meditation. Um, on the basis of meditation, uh, what then becomes possible is with that um, concentrated um, mind, uh, where actually our sense of self is um, very much attenuated, we can actually see into life. Uh, that's what we can do. Uh, we can actually sort of look into life. And the Buddha gives us sort of um, windows, uh, if you like, to do that. Uh, the window of impermanence. Impermanence isn't really a metaphysic uh, in Buddhism. It's, uh, if you like, a sort of doorway or a window. Uh, the Buddha is saying, look at this. Look at experience through this, this sort of concept. Um, don't, it's not a question of kind of thinking uh, about the concept, although that can be helpful. Uh, to get to know the door as it were but it's sort of looking through it at life looking into life and when our mind is much more concentrated uh, from ethics and meditation uh, you can start to see into life see it directly you don't see a metaphysic uh, you see life uh, it's beyond uh, the concepts uh, it's beyond concepts what you actually kind of see um, so that's the third stage the third stage of wisdom so that's that's the path of ethics, meditation, and wisdom. Um, <clears throat> and the point really being about regular steps is that if we want to see into life, uh, but we want to skip over ethics, uh, that troublesome kind of hard work, sort of engaging with our mixed motives sort of business, uh, <laughs> uh, then we'll struggle. We'll struggle to get there. But I want, as I say, uh, this week to focus much more on um ethics look at this aspect of uh ethics um it's a it's one of those words ethics isn't it um it sounds a bit theoretical already uh and it's not it's what we're talking about is how we act um as Maitre Bandu puts it we're talking about the fact that actions matter that's what it comes down to uh really uh that our actions really matter um <clears throat> and you know i mean that in the buddhist sense of the intention behind the action uh determines uh the the uh, what unfolds the consequence um so um that is something that i am still learning i'm still resisting uh it's it's uh it's very um, <clears throat> exposing in a way, uh, uh, teaching the Dharma, uh, <laughs> because you think, oh my God, you know, to what extent has that gone in? Uh, I think this aspect of getting to grips with ethics, it's not like it's a preliminary um, and we get onto the advanced stuff later. No, no, no. Uh, it goes deeper and deeper. Um, uh, you're going deeper and deeper into ethics and discovering more and more the mixedness of your <laughs> motives uh, in the process. Um, <clears throat> that's part of the purification. Um, but yeah, what is it that arises? Um, yeah, in the Buddha's words, um, happiness, sukkha. Um, 
uh, or the absence of dukkha, uh, the absence of unsatisfactoriness. Um, <clears throat> um, well, let, let me sort of uh, talk about that a bit through my own experience. Um, I, I think when I thought back, what actually came to mind in this area uh, was um, becoming a vegetarian, um, which wasn't planned. Um, I became a vegetarian after I got involved. I was going along to Tree Ratna Centre uh, in Sheffield and um, hadn't really occurred to me, actually, there's a link between vegetarianism and Buddhism. <laughs> but I found myself in this conversation with some of the, the people there at the centre um, who'd been coming along for a number of years. And uh, it was just a really, really sort of casual conversation. Uh, and they said, oh, well, about vegetarianism they said oh well why don't you why don't you try it um actually they said a little bit more than that uh i can't remember the words but the gist of it was that well maybe if you sort of feel that vegetarianism is a good thing it might be good for you it might have a good effect on you to act on that that was the gist of it mm. but it was as much the tone of the conversation actually that because i then went and did that and i discovered that Contrary to my theory that I didn't want to become a vegetarian because I liked meat too much and that was too much of a concession, uh, it'd be too hard. Contrary to my uh, ideas, it was really easy. <laughs> I never looked back. Um, so that's interesting in itself, isn't it? That we can have a theory about what it's going to be like um, that's, that's totally contrary to the experience. But as I say, it was the tone. It was very much the tone of the conversation. So the tone was like so um, sin moralism uh, without uh, without sons moralism. Uh, it was just like really sort of I didn't I didn't you know yeah I, I just didn't pick up any sense of kind of moralism. It's just like oh why don't why don't you try that you know see just try and see see what it's like. Um, and actually, I hadn't encountered that ethic to ethics before. Uh, so my notion of um of vegetarianism and uh why you would do that was basically um other people did it i thought that probably a good idea and uh i'd be a good person if i did that that's really what it was uh, and that wasn't enough for me um because actually i wasn't very attracted to the idea of being a good person uh, in that sense good person in the sense of how will people see me uh, that seemed to be all that was in it, um, uh, to my mind. That was actually my my ethics. Basically, I lived in a kind of amoral universe uh, where um, there isn't something inherently meaningful uh, sort of written into the universe. Um, instead, all that that decision amounts to is that I can't eat the things that I like on the menu, yeah? So it's simply a kind of can't do this, won't get that. You know, that was the universe that I sort of lived in. Um, and in that universe, I wasn't at all interested. I wasn't interested enough <laughs> uh, to become a vegetarian. Uh, perhaps surprise, surprise. <laughs> perhaps no surprises there. Um, so yeah, I started to encounter a different approach a different approach um and uh that sort of freed me up just to explore well what effect does it have is it possible that it could have a positive effect on me um and acting on that um what arose from that was i discovered myself as a moral agent uh, basically i discovered that oh gosh i can actually act on what I feel is right. I know that sounds like, duh, uh, shouldn't I have known that? Uh, uh, but actually what I mean is, um, you know, often it's rather fraught, isn't it? Or it can be fraught, should I do this, should I do that? Um, but in that moment, I sort of, I, dis I discovered this sense of sort of, uh, that it did matter to me, actually. It did matter to me. And that somehow I started to kind of come together, uh, cohere more as a person, 
who had more of a sense of choice and agency over how I act. That's what I discovered in the moment, um, in the act of actually doing that. Um, <clears throat> so whether that's sukkah, uh, whether that's kind of happiness and the absence of um, on, uh, uh, absence of suffering, um, well, they're rather clumsy terms, aren't they? But actually, it was a wonderful discovery. It was a wonderful discovery. It's sort of like discovering myself as a as a full human being. Actually, that's that was what it was like. Um, <clears throat> but that arose simply because of a purified intention. Uh, ordinarily, I'd be sort of thinking, you know, I really ought to do this. I should do this. Feeling slightly guilty uh, or kind of wanting to be seen as a good person, um, <laughs> uh, which of course is some kind of, it's either sort of craving or, you know, the guilt is a kind of bit of aversion, isn't it? I'm not sort of good enough kind of person. I need to, mm. I need to sort of uh, justify that by uh, appearing to be better than I, than I am. <laughs> yeah. So that was what arose for me. Um, and that's, um, well, I don't know about absence of suffering. Um, in a way, as I say, it can lead you to into uh, more challenges, actually, because uh, then you need to kind of confront uh, more difficult uh, uh, decisions. But just to discover that, that essentially human experience uh, of actually being able to, feeling some sense of agency, uh, some sense of choice uh, over what, what we... Um, how we act in the world. Um, has an effect on me, but it has an effect on others. It's meant that I've been able to, um, uh, well, as we do, positively influence other people uh, who've since become vegetarians, for example. It doesn't always work out in that sort of um, uh, like for like sort of way, but that's uh, that's how that that area has unfolded. So it's in this way that actions matter. Uh, actions really matter. Actions actually create the kind of uh, consciousness that we <clears> have. <throat> and it's the purity of those actions. It's not uh, just doing good actions, doing the good actions. It's actually the intention behind them uh, that uh, is going to um, <clears throat> allow you to discover yourself as a moral agent and actually kind of... Um, uh encourage other people engage with other people in that in that sort of in that sort of way so that's really what's being got at um and as i say that's that's still very much kind of working ground uh for me uh at deeper levels i kind of i believe that the that it's an amoral universe i can get away with doing this or i can do that and it doesn't have any consequences actually if i'm really honest with myself uh uh that happens uh, that happens but at deeper and deeper levels we're trying to sort of bring this um awareness that actions matter uh and slowly transform our, our consciousness so so one little thing here is that uh to me actually uh the idea that um ethics was about acting in a way that had positive consequences for me um sort of smacked of selfishness uh, <laughs> uh to me there was a sort of reservation there isn't that isn't that just sort of looking after yourself um a bit um yeah so i just wanted to sort of uh address that and um i guess the point is the point is it's, it's going back to this thing about purity of intention that in a way um well, there's an assumption there that pure intentions don't include your welfare. Yeah, uh, that pure intentions are sort of martyrdom, if you see what I mean. Uh, they don't include your intentions. Well, actually, pure intentions do include your welfare because uh, that's an important factor to acting in a more and more kind of skillful way. Yeah. Um, if, however, uh, your you're acting ethically, you're acting generously so that you get you get a nice uh, feeling or people like you. <laughs> well, that that dilutes that intention. Um, 
So that will have its own effect, won't it? Uh, that will have its own effect. So in a certain way, you don't need to worry um, <clears throat> about sort of selfish um, kind of motivations within uh, your ethical uh, life. Instead, uh, what we need to do, um, well, in, in fact, I'd say that will be there. Of course, that will be there. Of course, that will be there at times. Our, motive, our motives are almost always mixed to some extent. Um, but what we can do is just bring awareness into the experience. Um, that's what, what um, Buddhism is encouraging us to do. Uh, and actually explore, okay, well, um, it seems like my motives are mixed in this area. What is the consequence of that? We can still explore the fact that actions matter, the fact that actions have consequences uh, on our own consciousness. Yeah. A um, little example of that for me was actually uh, practicing generosity. And I realized um, through just paying attention to my experience that I'd, I'd, I'd uh, act generously and then I'd feel a bit flat afterwards and I thought oh that's interesting what's going on there uh, that prompted me into kind of self-awareness investigation of what are my intention I realized I was just acting out of guilt uh, a sort of sense that I'm not generous enough uh, so I should you know uh, be more generous uh, that wasn't apparent to me I, I didn't realize that I was acting out of guilt uh, uh, but it's through acting and then uh, noticing um being mindful of the actual effect uh on us of course on other people as well but on us uh can uh knock us back prompt us into awareness um that can help us start to discover what the intentions are yeah what our intentions are So, um, yeah, a little bit more on this this point that uh, Shabadasa brought up uh, and uh, Kaylee, is it Kaylee? Yeah, um, about our intentions being mixed. Um, <clears throat> so I've been uh, reading this book, which I found really, really interesting, called The Righteous Mind, um, <clears throat> which is a sort of... Um, uh, I think he's, I think he's called, a, is he called an evolutionary psychologist? Uh, Jonathan Haddit, H-A-I-D-T. I think, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but <laughs> that's how it's spelt. Um, <clears throat> and apparently, um, uh, scientists have discovered uh, back in the 80s um, that um, oh no, yeah. Uh, they anyway. I was reading this book. <laughs> <laughs> They've discovered something else back in the eighties. Uh, what I was going to say before that is is that that one of the things uh, that uh, there's growing evidence for is uh, that, that's covered in this book um, is that actually um, emotions, what we call emotions, there's this great sort of debate, isn't there, between uh, do we act ethically on the basis of reason? Uh, do we persuade ourselves to act ethically by kind of coming to a, a reasoned conclusion? Or is it emotion? Uh, are we driven by the emotions? Um, <clears throat> and what they've discovered is that actually, to some extent, that is a false, uh, it's too um, simplistic uh, to divide us up uh, as rational and emotional. They've discovered that actually the first component, uh, emotions actually sort of arise in steps. The first step uh, of our emotions is actually an appraisal uh, of the situation. Uh, isn't that interesting? Uh, so uh, just the same as kind of our visual sense, what we do um, is we pattern match. Uh, I'm sure you've all had that experience when you see a squiggly thing on the path and you see a snake, don't you? And then you look again and it's not, it's just a crinkly stick, wiggly stick. And it's in that sense that we kind of pattern match. Uh, well, actually that's what we do emotionally as well. Um, <clears throat> we meet someone and there's this instant appraisal. Um, you don't know what it, what's going on, uh, but it's kind of pattern matching, you know, oh God, beard, 
Uh, <laughs> don't like beards. <laughs> That's actually kind of what's going on uh, with the first stage. Um, this is what they discovered back in the 80s. <laughs> the first stage uh, of our emotion. So it's actually a kind of appraisal. Um, <clears throat> Um, and it seems uh, to be the case um, that that is actually uh, how, often how we are acting ethically. Uh, we make this kind of uh, sort of moral appraisal, this sort of moral intuition of the situation that we then act on. The thing is, that's all automatic. It's an automatic process, uh, so it's not conscious. It's not consciously deliberated. Um, apparently, in evolution, our um, our capacity to think and reason um, isn't actually uh, the same system uh, that um, makes those moral appraisals of the situation. It can come into play. Uh, but actually, it's largely a different system. Uh, so I found that incredibly helpful. I found that really, really helpful for understanding my own makeup, uh, because I can, someone can say, why did you do that? And I can come up with a justification for why I did that. And then there's some, some sort of gnawing sense that I'm not sure that that is actually true. Uh, I'm not sure if that is quite why. It might be, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, have you ever had that sense? And that is um, that's sort of backed up by this this um, uh, discovery in evolutionary psychology that actually they are sort of separate systems that we do sort of make these sort of moral intuitions, um, and then the our thinking capacity is much more related to justification justifying ourselves to other people it's concerned apparently with reputation so there we are it's difficult for us to actually get to what are our, our intentions it's difficult for us to to uh, develop awareness of what our intentions are it is possible uh, but it is difficult and one of the things that gets in the way is is this kind of um, concern for reputation uh, that activates our sort of rational justifying. Um, one way one way of talking about that is it's post hoc, uh, you know, ad hoc before the event. It's post hoc. It's after the event. It's not actually um, our rational faculty that decides uh, how we act. Um, anyway. Uh, um, I found that I, I found that very very interesting. Um, it's you know there's research behind it, uh, but it interests me because it, it relates it resonates with my experience actually. But it's not easy, uh, as you guys have been saying, to actually be aware of our intentions. Um, so, what do we do about that? I want just to to finish uh, with a, a few things that that. Um, uh, that the Buddhist tradition uh, kind of gives us uh, to kind of work with that, um, <clears throat> to develop more awareness uh, of what's actually driving us. Yeah. Um, so the two things, two things that that, that um, uh, Buddhism offers us actually, one is meditation. So that sounds a bit contradictory, doesn't it? Because uh, <laughs> isn't that going to be the next step? But actually, um, that's a lot of what we're doing or it's a significant part of what we're doing in meditation, is just, particularly in the Metta Bhavana, uh, just trying to bring more awareness into how actually am I responding to this person? What is that sort of <laughs> automatic kind of um, emotional appraisal uh, of this person? Yeah, there's a kind of immediate sort of um automatic uh kind of um appraisal kind of going on so in meditation really really important in the meditation that we um start with a receptivity to our actual experience when we bring the other person to mind um if we can actually uh bring more awareness into 
how we're actually responding, um, then we stand some chance uh, of um, <clears throat> uh, trying to um, find a purer uh, motive if it's if it's an impure impure sort of uh, impulse, uh, an impulse of kind of pushing away or or threat or something like that. Uh, it's only if we bring that into awareness that we stand some chance of actually uh, trying to contact uh, some purer motive. So that's part of what we're doing in meditation. So that's one thing I wanted to mention. And then the other actually is uh, good company. <laughs> so uh, that's the you know that's traditional trans traditionally translated. Um, uh, essentially spending time with other people who are trying to practice, uh, trying to practice ethics. Um, <clears throat> um, so that's that's been my experience, but I want to throw this back on you. We'll go into groups, break up into groups in the second half. Um, I find when I'm around um, uh, people who are practicing ethics, it brings me up. Uh, I sort of notice my uh, my sort of unskillful impulses much more clearly uh, because I'm around other people who are uh, trying not to do those uh, those things. It's not even necessarily actually sometimes that conscious. There's just a bit of a uh, there's a kind of there's an impulse to act in a particular way or say a particular thing, and uh, then I don't go down that road. Uh, perhaps in some other company, unfortunately, I would. <laughs> yeah, or, or it can be more conscious. It can be that I say something um, and a, a friend says, <laughs> the eyebrow is raised, and I say, yeah, 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 I don't mean that exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, those two things, meditation and uh, kind of good company. And um, it helps, doesn't it, to have a common understanding of ethics so um that's what the precepts are they're kind of these common rules of thumb common guidelines um so we've got the five precepts uh the five precepts of abstaining um undertaking the, the training precept training principle of abstaining from harm of taking the not given of sexual misconduct of untruthful speech and of unmindfulness. Uh, and they're also formulated in the positive as with, with deeds of love and kindness, I purify my body uh, with open-handed generosity, I purify my body. With stillness, simplicity and contentment, I purify my body. With truthful communication, I purify my speech. And with mindfulness, clear and radiant, I purify my mind. So, uh, in a way, we need some common basis. Uh, I mean, they're largely held by everybody, but it can help just to have, in a way, a sort of agreed um, understanding of what ethics is in order for us to sort of um, help each other uh, in order for um, this aspect of the, the company we keep um, to help us uh, develop more awareness of what our intentions actually are. Yeah. So I want to stop there and um, actually just go into meditation, just do a bit of meditation and explore a little bit uh, in the Metta Bhavna, this aspect of Metta Bhavna uh, that is uh, developing more awareness, bringing more awareness into uh, our, this, this first uh, step in emotions, very, very faint, um, very easy to push aside and ignore, but actually in meditation, we're trying to sensitize ourselves uh, to these quite subtle impressions or appraisals, emotional or intuitive, if you like, um, sense of somebody. Um, that's what we'll try and tune into and, and uh, develop more awareness of. Let's just see if we can um, feel it, yeah? Uh, feel the heart. Uh, what does it feel like to bring this person to mind? We just stay with that and see if by staying with that, we can become more aware of what that is, what that kind of initial appraisal or response actually is. Yeah, we'll try that. And if we can become aware of that in a totally guilt-free kind of way, uh, it's not about, this is not about being good. 
um, <clears throat> uh, this is the sort of adventure of actually seeing how we can change our consciousness. Let's forget about what other people think. Uh, let's just own that adventure. Um, if we can see more clearly what it is, then we might be able to uh, just act in a way that encourages uh, another more positive um, impulse. Yeah. So let's let's just give it a go. Let's just um, go into meditation very briefly. Right. So we we'll go for a tea break uh, now, and then we'll explore this a bit more in groups in seconds. 